Okay, cool. Well, so it's been, um, I don't know how many of you people are old timers who actually know who I am, um, but it's been quite a while since I've even been to one of these conferences because as it happens, I was always in London, whatever they were happening or, or whatever. Um, but so I, I um, for those of you who don't know, uh, was the original author of the Mathematica Notebook front end um, many, many, many years ago, but have not actually done much here for a while. Um, and so I'm going to start off, uh, which is sort of like a three-part talk. I'm going to start off by giving a very brief update of what's some of the things I've been, what's my name? You saying people don't know who I am? It's, on, it's right there on the schedule. Anyway, my name is Theodore Gray. Um, uh, in fact, you can tell that from my uh, uh, URL. Um, so these are a few of the things that I've been off doing, um, uh, working on, on element books, a new molecule book, which has just come out, and various other sorts of things. Um, in particular, starting a company called Touch Press, which grew out of the Elements app. Um, and relevant to you know, Mathematica and why I'm here is that in many cases, even though we're developing iPad apps, uh, at least for the ones where I'm involved in detail in the design and production of them, I make very heavy use of Mathematica in various perhaps unexpected ways to, uh, uh, to, to, you know, to develop these apps. Um, so I'll tell you just a few examples of how that works. Um, uh, two of them from the app Disney Animated. So this was uh, an app that I ended up being the author of and, and kind of designer of. Uh, even though when I was growing up, I was not actually allowed to watch Disney movies um, because my family considered them lowbrow or something. Um, so I had to do sort of a, a crash course in how great Disney is, um, which actually, it turns out, it is actually pretty amazing with some of the things that they did. Um, and so we were, we were engaged in this project uh, to make an app all about Disney. Um, and one of the things in it was uh, a simulation, what I call an authentic replica, because Disney likes that kind of terminology, of the snow in the movie Frozen, which has uh, just come out last year. Um, and so the, the snow that's in that movie is, of course, CGI snow. And it's a tremendously complicated algorithm. Uh, runs, you know, minutes per frame or something on big supercomputers. But we need to make something that would run in real time um, on an iPad. And this is, uh, this is an example of our, you know, our code running um, on an iPad, and you can just swipe your finger and you get it, and it works. Um, and the way this was done, basically, was me sitting with a laptop running Mathematica in a room full of the Disney effects engineers, uh, tweaking the algorithm in Mathematica sort of in real time, uh, making it, you know, trying to get it to look like their very complicated fluid dynamics thing that they have. Uh, and it was really fundamental to the ability to do that, that the whole thing in Mathematica was a couple dozen lines long, maybe, most of which was kind of fluff. And the, the heart of it is very simple. And because of that, it was possible to sort of completely recast the algorithm a couple of times. Um, and of course, you know, it was doing it with maybe 500 particles running in a, in a dynamic module. Um, which was actually something I invented many years ago. Um, and it was kind of satisfying to see that it actually does work. When you get on the other side of the fence, it really does work as advertised, and it's a very useful thing. Um, and we eventually came up with something where we did with 500 particles that sort of qualitatively looked right. And then we re-implemented the whole thing in C code um, and OpenGL uh, to run in real time on an iPad. Um, another thing that we did was I had this idea that we should have some way of showing an entire movie representing it in one single image in a way that would sort of capture some essence of the movie and make it recognizable, uh, at least to somebody who knows the movie, uh, as, as being characteristic of that film. And here's the code that is sort of turns out to be key to that. The issue is that um, what I, wanted to, I wanted to show sort of the progression of colors throughout the movie. Because movies kind of, they have a rhythm to them. And they, you know, there's kind of ups and downs. And there's happy scenes and sad scenes. And this is often very carefully engineered in terms of the color palette. And I wanted to sort of pull that out. And people have tried to do this. People make like little micro thumbnails, you know, a poster with a whole movie with all the thumbnails. But the problem with that is that um, as soon as you sort of pull back to the point where you're seeing the whole movie, everything has gotten so small that all the colors blend together in exactly the way that pixels on a screen blend together. So like if you have a frame that's a red car in a green field with blue sky, you know, very bright primary colors, you shrink it down and it's just brown or gray or something. There's no color left because everything blends. 
So what you have to do if you want to preserve the colors is you have to sort of pull them apart and you have to essentially sort them. But you can't sort them because colors are three-dimensional things and there's no sorting order that will get you anything sensible. You know, you can't sort by brightness because then the hues are scattered. You can't sort by hue because then the brightnesses are scattered. What you have to do is cluster them. And so it turns out this little bit of code was the key to making this possible. You just, you import frames of the movie, you take the data as if it was just X, Y, Z data, and you simply call find clusters on it. I didn't have to use any options. And it very effectively identifies typically half a dozen or so um, groupings of color that are more similar to each other, particularly with animated movies. And then I use that as the sort of first order sort to pull the colors apart. And this is what the output of that code with a few little extra things, options and things looks like. So you can see this is a frame from Lion King. And uh, there are, you know, there's some bl blurriness, whatever, some fuzzing. But there's clearly some blue, some green, you know, some dark, some browns, whatever. Um, and this is a little movie that I made, also, of course, 100% using Mathematica that illustrates this process. You break it up, you do a cluster, you sort the clusters by brightness, and then by brightness within, and you do that for every frame. And you just kind of keep doing that, and eventually you get uh, an image that's the entire movie. This is a close-up here. And you see there's, there's no blending. There's never any averaging of colors. There's only selection. Obviously, you have to cut it down. Um, selection and pulling apart and sorting. Um, and here is, this is all of Lion King. And if you know Lion King, you can actually, you can basically trace the plot out. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's fire at the end, it's kind of cut off there. You know, there's happy, there's sad, there's whoever they are, Timba and the other guy, you know, off. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I'm not, I'm not actually a Disney expert. Um, um, so these, these, each one of these images takes about 24 hours of time on an eight core Mac tower to do, you know, to extract the frames for the movie, uh, extract the pixels, put them into groups, it kind of does cuts where the camera shifts, takes pools of, of pixels, clusters them, and generates this final output image. And you'll see one of these in, in the app for every movie. It's direct output of Mathematica, there's no post-processing or whatever. Uh, you'll also see this, which is, is my favorite image um, uh, that I've produced in recent times. Uh, this is every single Disney movie from Snow White through Frozen. Um, and uh, I don't know how well it's coming through on the projector, but it's really kind of cool. You can see trends in uh, the color palettes that are used. Even though in this screen you're seeing 75 years of movie making. Uh, I, if I did the math, there's uh, on a 5 megapixel Retina iPad screen, Every pixel in the image represents about an eight-hour work day um, to produce it. Because, of course, in order to make this image, you first have to make all the movies. And it takes hundreds of man years of work per movie. Um, so there's just a, it's an astonishing amount of human effort that's been crunched down and compressed and put into one image. Um, and it's remarkable that you can do that and actually still see anything. Um, and, and, you know, and Mathematica was absolutely fundamental. Nobody has ever d tried to do this before because nobody has applied, um, you know, sort of level of mathematical analysis to it that's necessary. Uh, and there we go, exactly 10 minutes as allocated to the introductory portion of the talk. Um, because now we're going to move on to something completely different, um, which is a different thing that I've been doing uh, together with my lovely collaborator and amazingly also girlfriend, Nina, uh, who will be doing this talk with me. Uh, and, and that is uh, something called stitch coding, which is a word that I made up because I was feeling too nerdy and I thought there should be a better word for this, um, this particular process uh, or application of Mathematica, um, which, uh, you know, which is another kind of thing that doesn't, it doesn't sound like it's very mathematical, like you know, making images of movies, maybe not so mathematical. Uh, likewise, um, quilting and embroidery maybe don't initially sound like they're difficult mathematical problems, but it turns out if you want to do them in a certain way, um, they're actually tremendously complex mathematical challenges f um, for which the world needs Mathematica. Um, so we're gonna talk um, a bit. So, so, so there's two fundamental domains, quilting and embroidery. They're, they're actually quite different, even though they both involve thread. The number one thing about quilting is the thread must go on. Don't cut the thread, because anytime you do that, there's trouble. So when you look at quilt designs like this, pretty much everything is one continuous line 
it's been you know, all stitched without stopping. At least that's the first approximation. Sometimes you have to, and so then you deal with it. Um, and, but rather than looking at a design that complicated first, let's look at this. this so this is what I initially would have considered a pretty simple design. Um, it turns out for commercial um, stitch, uh, you know, quilting and embroidery software, this is way beyond the level of complexity that they are able to handle finding a route to, to stitch this with. If you give them anything more than about the head, it just, it just crashes or just can't do it. It says, no, never mind, can't do that. Um, the challenge here is, you know, you have this design, you want to stitch it without stopping. So it turns out you know, this is trivially recast into a network traversal problem. Every place that um, a line meets another line, like at a T intersection, that's a node. And all the connections between those nodes are edges of the graph. And so here's that same figure. Um, it's the same lion thing, um, except we've just let you know, graph plot lay out the connectivity of it so that we can examine it as a graph problem. Uh, and then you, you call this beautiful function, find postman tour, and you're done. Uh, it takes less than a minute to do that, to, to, you know, you call that function and it's simply done. Um, and this is the path that it finds. Um, it, you know, it's a, it's a theorem that for anything beyond the simplest graphs, you will have to double stitch some lines. And that's okay, the machine's pretty accurate. Um, but, you know, boom, there you go. And here's uh, a video of an embroidery machine. Um, you know, once you've got the path, it's just the file format is incredibly trivial. It just outputs just a set of XY coordinates to say stitch here, stitch here, stitch here, and the machine does it. Um, now, you may wonder, oh, you're going to hold that up in a minute, but not yet, because we haven't got there. You may wonder why, you know, I mean, people, you can do this by hand. People, you know, people have done this many times. Um, oh, and th this is a slightly fancier version without the noise. Um, people have made designs like this, of course. People have done, you know, much, much more elaborate automated embroidery designs like this. But they do them by hand, which is a pain. And they're particularly a pain if you want to do it more than once. And as it happens, Nina is an animator. And so we never do anything once. Um, so here's the same code run uh, multiple times on multiple patterns that are all subtly different and all have completely different connectivity. You know, the graph from one is unrelated to the graph for the next one. Um, and so here it is stitched out. Um, with some embellishments and there's some echoing and, and things. Um, yeah. And the wonderful thing about doing something physical like this is you don't end up with just a, a thing you can show on the screen. You get like a thing. Can we pass it around or something? Yes, it's, you can pass it it's, around. Does someone like to fondle this? It's like it's soft and warm. Just throw it out there or something. <laughs> it's not just an algorithm. It's an algorithm that becomes... Anyway, so now, now let's look at a, a much more complicated design. So this is a $1,000 bill. Um, this, is a, this is a scan you know, of a, of a 1934 $1,000 bill. Um, this is Nina's expert line art rendering of it. So in this image, there are no fills. There's no polygons, whatever. There's just lines. And we can see that if we look at a close-up of it. Um, it's just a whole bunch of little lines. Uh, and no, no, we're not ready for that yet. Um, the only part of this that I can take responsibility for are these what are called guilloche patterns, the sort of security printing patterns, which I didn't know what would get into this. But those are actually, they really are security, or at least used to be before digital printing, because they're made with these sort of, it's like a spirograph with maybe 10 concentric gears. And each gear is set to a certain ratio and a certain you know, offset or whatever. And it's, it's called a guilloche lathe. And the thing runs and it traces out a pattern. And it's actually, it's sort of cryptographically difficult to work backwards from the pattern to what the settings of the wheels must have been. So if the only thing you have is the pattern that's produced, and you wish to make an engraving plate by tracing a stylus over a piece of metal, it's virtually impossible to do. Um, and that's no, no longer the case, because printing presses now. You, know, you can have digital printing, whatever. You can reproduce it at extremely high resolution. You can't do that with thread. So these, these stitch, stitched guilloche patterns are, you know, I think, are cryptographically secure and identify this particular design, and you know we're not releasing the, the parameters to make that. Anyway, so again, it's a it's a you know we need to stitch it. It has to be one line, um, but there's way more lines in this one. And here's these are just a selection. It turns out you can't actually do it as one because there's separate letters. There's various parts of it that have to be disconnected. So it breaks down into a couple of dozen separate graphs, 
and these are images of those graphs. This is the main one. There's one big chunk which has all the guilloche patterns and all the sort of connected stuff around it. It doesn't look that bad, but, but uh, so this is like a tiny corner of it. Um, it's a tremendously detailed, complicated graph. Um, let's see, so the, the statistics, 50,000 nodes, 64,000 connections, and it turns into about 350,000 stitches once it's been connected. Um, and it takes um, like four or five hours um, for Mathematica to you know, do the analysis of the connectivity, create the graph, and then do the find postman tour call on that to find, um, to find a path. But it finds a path. It just it keeps working, and it doesn't run out of memory, and it finds a path. So in order to deal with big patterns like this, you need a big machine. This is Nina's amazing quilt monster or something. Um, it's a fully automated, uh, it's basically an XY plotter, except instead of a pen, there's a sewing machine. Uh, and this is, um, uh, the, in, in this machine, it's the head that moves, but we mounted a GoPro camera to the head, so it looks like the fabric's moving. Um, it will go up to 2,000 stitches per minute, which is very fast. Um, but it, it also will do you know, very intricate, detailed little patterns. Uh, if we're about to go on a little tour of the whole design here. Um, yeah, so there it goes off. Um, I think it does a little biddling around here, but then, then we're gonna pull back and see the bill it's working on. Uh, um, I guess while that's stitching, we can hold up, well you can hold up that one, that's, but that's a, that's a single thousand dollar bill. And what that, what that machine is actually working on is, um, is this thing, which is the $10,000 quilt. Um, uh, and this has, I think it's almost two million stitches in it roughly. It took about a week of running on the machine. Um, and then, uh, and then just for good measure, Nina binds them all, which is like applying the ribbon around the outside using a foot pedaled treadle machine to provide some contrast with the giant computerized thing. There's the quilt. Um, so my, my little take on this is that if you have quilted money, um, you need to have a bank. And fortunately, my other office is located in a bank. Um, so we actually had, this is not actually our vault. We have like in the basement, we have a not less attractive vault, but we do actually have a vault and these bills are stored in the vault. And we operate a bank, quiltbank.com, where you can, uh, you can exchange these. There's, of course, there's no discount on money. Uh, so these quilts cost $1,000. Um, and uh, Nina has produced a, a lovely checklist of the advantages of soft money over regular. You know, you can use it for political contributions. Um, if it gets dirty, you can launder it. You know, there's, um, there's all kinds of things you can do. Um, uh, so, okay, that's quilting. Next is embroidery. So, to, quilting is basically fine postman tour. That is the fundamental problem of quilting. Uh, the fundamental problem of embroidery is space filling curves. That was just a picture of the embroidery machine there. So, with embroidery, you want to fill up a whole area. And this turns out also to be quite tricky. And it turns out that the commercially available software for doing it is also quite inadequate. Um, so here, this is a little animation that shows, this is a little test figure that I made. The idea is you want to, you want to fill up this whole shape and um, you don't want to cut the thread. You don't want to start and stop. So what you can do is you can travel out to the end of a little pocket and then stitch back. And it's fine to stitch over something, you know, and then you don't see what was underneath. And so this is showing, you know, this, this turns again into a graph theory problem. You take the space and you kind of analyze the topology of it and you figure out what the connectivity is of the different regions. And that depends on what direction the stitches are going. Um, because it, with the stitches going in a different direction, uh, it's basically, what I think of it is you have a branched hallway and you're painting and you want to paint the hallway in such a way that you don't have to step over what you've already painted. And you're OCD and you're only willing to paint in exactly one direction. <laughs> and so that determines, you know, how, what you can get to. And it turns out you can always do it um, and you just have to sort of travel and you have to figure out in what order should I travel. So this is a bunch of, of Mathematica code that's figuring that out based on a certain angle. So um, now to apply it, we start with Nina's unbelievable animations. Um, and uh, so, th so what I get basically on the nerd side of the enterprise is uh, polygons. Um, and simplified for this process. Simplified for this process. Yes, yes. They're much, the actual animations as rendered for computer use 
are way more detailed than this. But you know, thread, it's thread. First thing I do, as you heard in last in Roger's talk, um, I use regions. I, I think I started region, using regions in alpha versions of OS 10 or Mathematica 10 slightly before they were ready for prime time, and there were many bugs, but it's gotten a lot better. Um, so there, I turn all the polygons into regions, and there's no hidden surface removal. So all of these things are sort of stacked up. Um, you can see like the, the shapes are complete. Then I use um, a region intersection, I think is the function call, basically using the region operations to punch out the things that are underneath, uh, and then modify their shapes a little bit because the thread stretches, so you want to you know, you want to make some adjustments to them. It's all, you know, it's 100% it's region code um, that's doing the geometrical manipulation of these things. And then I apply that algorithm that you just saw um, using a stitching direction that's based on the shape of the polygon to figure out a pattern. Um, next question is, in what order should the colors be stitched? So for example, if you were to stitch the body first and then the hooves, the hooves would be disconnected from each other. So first, you want, to, you want to stitch the hooves first, because that way you can travel through the body to get to all of them without cutting the thread. And so there's a level of analysis that's done. Um, what's actually surprising is like two lines of Mathematica that figures out what's the optimal color order to minimize the number of times that connected areas become disconnected by having you know, been stitched first. So in this, for this particular thing, this is the order in which it decides to fill in the colors. Um, this is a time lapse of, it actually takes about five minutes. It's a bad time lapse, but there you go. And at the very end, you'll see why cutting the thread is bad. Uh, yeah, see? Um, because when it screws up, it's always when it tried to cut a thread. It can do it, but you don't want to. Um, so this is a collection of um, figures like that, which have been stitched together six on a frame. Um, we did 516 of them. Um, each with a unique design. So, you know, in other words, the, met the code, all the geometry, all the region code, all the uh, stitches, whatever, is rerun 516 times on 516 completely different designs as far as the stitching is concerned. And the result, if we, we need sound. Uh, is somebody going to get us sound? Yeah, we had sound. Right, okay, so here's the result. Um, it starts off not actually animated, we'll see. Right. By the way, no one's ever done this before in this kind of level of detail and quality of embroidery. Yeah, this is like a test. This is not real yet. It'll look a lot better when it's real. Um, it's a folk song of some sort. I don't really know this culture. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> yeah, so, so that was really an inordinate amount of work to produce that, I have to say. Both, you know, both Nina's animating um, and the mathematical processing and the physical stitching of it. Like this, there's nothing photoshopped here. Those are actual photographs of actual things which are stacked up in the office now. Um, raw, like that's, it's actually there, which is very satisfying but also very labor intensive. Um, and, you know, fundamentally possible only because of the sort of application of fairly sophisticated mathematical techniques made possible by these beautiful algorithms built into Mathematica. Um, and, 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 and the beautiful front end that lets me play with these things um, and, uh, you know, experiment with these algorithms in a graphically rich environment where I can actually see these images right there in the notebook and manipulate them as data. Um, uh, really satisfying to see how well Mathematica actually works when you're forced to use it to, to do something useful. Um, <laughs> well, useful defined in a certain way, I guess. Um, okay, and now uh, it's Nina's turn. <laughs> okay, um, so I want to talk about single line art. Um, what Teo and I have been working on, what he's shown you so far, is I'll draw things, Teo will 
route them and process them and stitch code them so they can be stitched. Uh, but really, um, uh, computing could be used more in the art side of it. Um, single line art being the holy grail of quilting design, you don't want to break thread. Um, so I actually made this holy grail to try to illustrate this purpose. Unfortunately, I had to do this by hand because I don't have any tools for automatically taking my line art and making it into single line art. Uh, the, what Teo's been doing is um, amazing, uh, and it involves backstitching. Um, this particular one doesn't really have backstitching. This one just has uh, little line segments taken out and little line segments added to make it a single line piece of art. But anyway, single line art, um, TSP art, traveling salesman problem art. Um, is anybody not familiar with that? That's sort of the way single line art has been cracked. Uh, and the way that works is you have an image, you turn it into a set of stipples, more stipples where it's darker, fewer stipples where it's lighter. You run a path through it. Um, you continue running that path, you optimize it, and eventually it will look more like this. Um, I did some tests using this actual process. Uh, we have not actually stitched this little piece of embroidermation. This is a very early test. Um, and you can see that the fill pattern is all one density, and then where it's not stitched is another density. Um, I did this variation on it. This is supposed to be gray fabric with the, you know, the object in dark thread and the background in light thread. Um, but different densities isn't the only way you can achieve contrast and show images with single line art. Now, this is not actually single line art because, again, I don't have a tool for making this. Hint, hint, if somebody wants to work on developing tools that would allow me to make this. But um, can, you know, I'm looking at this from an angle. Yeah, I can see like serious contrast from this angle. These lines are the same density. I have two fills of exactly the same density and exactly the same pattern, but they're turned at right angles, and because of that, you can actually see a shape. Uh, here it is closer in case it looked like square. You get even more richness when you start to vary the pattern. So here I have horizontal lines against a swirly pattern. Close up again. Now when you have these different patterns and then you also start uh, working with different densities of line, then you can get this incredibly rich palette, which is sort of analogous to colors, but it's all just done with lines. Again, this is not a single line, but it could be a single line if tools existed. So back to uh, traveling salesman problem art, it always has the same look. If you see a piece of TSP art, the, the pattern that it's going to generate is always going to look something like this. And this is familiar to quilters who call this stippling. This was stitched by a quilter named Leah Day, who um, she is sort of like an online teacher of free motion quilting, the reason I got into it. Uh, and here's another fill pattern. So stippling is just one of thousands. This one's called basic spiral, and you know, it's an algorithm. Uh, and when you quilt these things by hand, you're like running a human readable algorithm, um, which sort of puts you in this meditative zone. I think that's why people enjoy quilting. And here is Leah just describing the rules to a human being. They're very sort of vague, they're not very strict, but there are rules, and I'll just let her talk about them. Start by nice medium sized spiral uh, and you want to leave enough space for you to kind of backtrack and get back out of it and then uh, we're just going to kind of stack two of these on top of one another and you saw me kind of stitch that little point right there what I was doing is I'm just trying to fill in the space as evenly as possible and occasionally you'll have to make points like that and I don't want these to s start stacking up too evenly so now I'm going to branch out kind of make it a little bit more random and start filling in some different sizes and shapes of spirals. Sometimes you're going to catch yourself, you're going to have some uh, awkward areas like that area right there where you're going to have to make up the uh, smaller shape or kind of split it in half. And so then you just continue to fill in your area with spirals. And anytime you have a space uh, such as right here um, where there's not enough space to actually stitch a spiral, but you still need to fill in that area, just stitch a point and that will fill it in very nicely uh, and kind of keep it flowing very evenly. But here's what it looks like when you finish. So there are, you know, sort of an infinite variety of variations on these designs. Leah Day has cataloged more than 400 of them. She gives them all names. She makes a video for every single one. She has books of them. I have a couple of them here. There's way more that are possible. Um, as far as I know, people are not 
doing things like this digitally, and I would like it if they did, because currently when I think of an art project that involves fills like this, I have to draw it myself. Um, here's an example of one that I did by hand, uh, and it's simple contrast. Uh, there's either a quilted or unquilted area. In the quilted areas, I just you know put all these different fill designs in by hand. Um, they kind of they almost start creating themselves after a while if you do it for long enough, um, and that gives it like a richness, even though tonally it's just in contrast with the unquilted areas. Um, but there's there's no way I'm aware of that. This can be, I mean, that this has been automated. Of course, it can be automated, but it hasn't been automated. So for the work that Tao and I do, I still have to draw the fill patterns myself. And the way I do that is I'll draw some sort of branching shape, and maybe I'll add some more branches. As long as I don't make a hole, it works. I'll convert strokes into shapes. I'll stroke the whole thing, get rid of the shape, and there I have like a single line, a space filling curve. Um, this one, unfortunately, I had to do by hand, even though it looks like a computer has made it. It would be nice, you know, again, if the computer could make it. There it is stitched. That's how I did the fill pattern. I was really hoping that you know this could have been algorithmically generated, but we don't have that yet, but I'm hoping we will. Um, so I drew this one by hand, and that's what's on our $1,000 bill. A uh, similar technique for this. Um, you know, this, this is more you know, the human touch, but the, the areas, I don't know how much you can really see, the areas in the corners, those could continue to be generated if you know, there were rules for it. There it is stitched, front and back. Here's just another example of it. Again, all these things I had to do by hand, um, but uh, it doesn't seem like it needs to be. So here, for this talk, I just drew something, um, you know, just drew like a single line fill, uh, and then did a little um, computer time lapsey thing. I actually bought software that would record what I was doing and speed it up. Um, and this is not knowing where I was going, um, but I am following certain rules as I'm drawing it. And if, if this were quilting, it would be, you know, a nice fill. Um, and I really do believe that a program could generate something like this. It's just, it's not yet. Uh, uh, that one's just running slower, I'll skip that. Anyway, here is uh, that holy grail again. This is the drawing that I made before I turned it into single line art. If I had a laser pointer, I could show you how. It's not actually a single line. There's, there's little pieces of it that are disconnected from other pieces. So another great tool would be something that could take something like this and just you know, automatically find little gaps that it could add a little line to to jump across, make it a single line, and the other lines that were redundant if they were small, get rid of those. Um, but instead, I had to do that by hand. Um, and I'm just you know, showing um, you all this. Yep. Bas basically listing all the things I haven't managed to no, write no. for her. In that <laughs> no, you're not going to do them. When, when this started, Taya was like, get Chris Carlson. Chris Carlson would want to do it. And Chris has actually worked on this a little bit. But um, uh, there is so much that could be done with this. And I think it would be so interesting because Actually, you know what? I think what you said was, oh, that's been done. I mean, that's trivial, right? Like, everybody, you know. Yeah, I assumed that, that somebody must have done this before. But yeah. As far as we can tell, not really. Not the, the kinds of patterns that she wants. Yeah. And also, not, you know, the, the single line, the traveling po po uh, Chinese postman problem, you know, that assumes that you actually have the lines touching each other and that you are not going to modify the graph. You know, in, in her ideal algorithm, the thing would actually, you know, be equivalent of a. a a postman who says, you know what, that street is just not important <laughs> enough. We're just going to skip that one. Um, or, you know, if there was a better road here, just a short little section of road, if somebody would build that, everything would be much easier. And so let's make that road. And, you know, that's not within the scope of what that, those algorithms are able to do. And, you know, it's beyond my um, uh, mathematical depth to invent new algorithms that would uh, actually you know, have those sort of levels of optimization built in. Yeah, but I, I think the space filling curves is even more interesting. Like, and that's that sort of generative, you know, organic algorithm type stuff that I don't do. Yeah. Anyway, that's just I just wanted to show what this problem is because um, this would be amazing if it were cracked. Uh, we could really up our level of stitch art, and that's it. Yeah, we have a lot of time for questions. Okay, great. Okay. So, yeah, so um, we have... Oh, the quilt plotter? Yeah. Um, there's actually, yeah, there's, there's a guy that uh, 
one person that sells those in the United States. They're made in China. Just about any cheap quilt that you get here will have been made on a machine like that in China. These have been modified. Uh, uh, William. William Altman. The company is called Quilt Masters or Quilting Masters or something like that. I mean, the machine is a, you know, it's, it's essentially an off-the-shelf piece of industrial production hardware for making quilts. Um, it's just that normally they're, you know, much, much simpler designs with maybe, you know, two inches between, rather than, you know, a couple of millimeters between lines here. And they, you know, and they're all in China. There's, I think, I think when we bought this one, uh, it was the only one west of the Mississippi or east of the Mississippi. Which, are, which side are we on? We're on the east. <laughs> anyway, it, was the, it was the only one on our side of the Mississippi that, uh, in this country, because there's just no reason to have a machine like that here. Um, yeah, and we're using it stupidly. I mean, we're using it insanely. These are incredibly inefficient to quilt because these little swirly patterns on them go so slowly. They can do, what, 2,000 or 2,500 2, stitches, 2, a stitches a minute? If it's a straight line, that's fast. But this, this, this takes so long. Yeah, the inertia of the, the head moving you know, means it has to accelerate and decelerate slowly. And normally, you'll, if you look at quilts, you'll see that they're, you know, they're these big sweeping arcs and things that, that are efficient for the machine to do. Oh, and if you're interested um, in seeing this, we can, if people want to arrange we a... We could have a tour. Yeah, we, we could have, have a tour. It's on the other side of town, but um, it's here. Yeah, and also we're, um, we have meeting room number one downstairs if you want to look at some of the embroidery samples and other things like that. We'll have a table of those. Um, so that, that, particular ex that particular example is filled with uh, fixed density of stitches everywhere. Um, you don't have to do that. Actually, I brought somewhere in this piles of stuff is Let's, some tests we were doing yeah. to kind of use, um, kind of vary that. Uh, in order to you know, produce more interesting kinds of fill patterns. And like I would like to do, for larger versions of the goat, I would like to do goat hair, where there's, you know, it's like scraggly looking uh, over stitching in such a way that it looks kind of like a layered haircut. And I would also like to have it respond to the movement so that like the, you know, the threads would kind of sway as the goat is bouncing. Um, and I was also working on some stone wall patterns using a uh, Voronoi diagram to generate what looked like you know, sort of stones that have been fit together and then use contrasting directions of stitches. Uh, it's really, it's great having kind of the, the ability to just, if you can sort of mathematically describe what you want, then just generate it automatically rather than having to draw these things by hand. And, and of course, that's a prerequisite for anything that we're doing because everything has to be automatable because it's going to get done hundreds and hundreds or even thousands of times um, in frames of animation. And yeah, if you come downstairs, we'll have, yeah, I have examples them here. to see. Oh, that, okay, yeah. yes, right. Yeah, well, you probably can't see them from here. Yeah. Plus, you have to touch them. The stone walls in particular, I really like sort of texture of them. Yeah, and this is unlike any existing embroidery software. Embroidery software sucks. It's really, it's criminally bad and expensive. <laughs> um, it depends uh, for the, uh, we fight over stabilizer. Much. Yes, I'm a stable, <laughs> stabilizer person. Um, I, I guess the embroidery all has stabilizer. The quilt's done. Oh, you didn't show the tree. The tree. The uh, the yeah. The we, tree with the leaves falling. We have an oh, embroidered another, flip book that Teo made. It's insane. Uh, Where another, is that? Yeah, since we have a little uh, bit of time. Right here we go. There's some other quilted embroidery. Right, so this is, this is our first animated embroidery test. Oh, the tree. Um, wow. And this was, this was during my oh, thick stabilizer phase. Um, <laughs> what? Right, so this, this is the flip book of that animation, which... Um, <laughs> it's kind of, it's hard to flip it, actually. It was actually, it was, it was sort of funny. I was doing this kind of at the same time as I was writing about Disney, and we ended up sort of um, recreating some of the early history of hand-drawn animation because, um, you know, we had to, we actually made things, and I ended up making what's called a down shooter, which is how they made, before they invent, invented the multiplane camera, they, you know, they would have these, these um, uh, acetate cells, um, cellulite cells, celluloid, whatever. Celluloid. Celluloid something. Um, you know, they, they would paint on, and then they would stack them up and 
you know, lay them down flat on a table with special pegs that were patented special pegs, um, and then have a sheet of glass and there's a movie camera up there and takes a picture. So there's basically a guy who sits there for days and days and weeks and months on end, putting a thing on, put the glass down, push the button, take a picture, take it all apart again, put the next one down, put it down. And I ended up doing exactly that, except I made an apparatus with some you know, folding halves and cutting templates and things to, to take uh, sheets like this that had been stitched, cut them precisely. You see there's a kind of a frame that it stitches around each one that provides a reference. Uh, and that fits into a frame, gets cut out, and then each fits into another frame and is held down. And there's a camera uh, exactly the way they made hand-drawn animation. Um, uh, oh, yeah. And then there's, there's this one. Um, so this is uh, a thing which we have somewhere, another little test. And here it is animated. Um, this was I an outtake from Sita Sings the Blues, a rotoscoped outtake. And Teo generated the moving background pattern yeah, in Mathematica. Yeah, I made the sine waves. Um, which you notice they're carefully adjusted so that they cycle, so that they loop. Um, yes. And yeah, and, and, and lots of stabilizer. Nina wants everything to be floppy and irregular. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of trying to turn this into an engineering discipline and keep the fabric stable and not stretching. And you know, it really bugs me that like in the tree here, uh, you can see there's kind of a little bounce to it. Uh, that drives me That's nuts. Uh, the bounce is not supposed to be there. That's failure of the stabilizer. Well, but this was, it's, this was one of our earliest projects, and this is where we realized that the next project. <laughs> True, I suppose. Well, it's, it's actually, it turns out that the, the, the systematic pulsing shake like that is because of the stitch order being wrong. Um, it, it, if it had stitched the frames in a different order, like doing one frame at a time, and rather than doing you know, six on a sheet, doing all the trunks and then all the leaves and whatever, it wouldn't have shaken like that. But it was just, it's too much work to do it over again. Okay, so 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 the way this works is you see, um, again, because of the desire not to cut the thread, the leaves are stitched first, and there's actually lots of green thread that's <laughs> underneath the branches of the tree, so that they're all because they're all connected to each other, so it never has to stop. And then it goes and does the, the branches of the tree and covers that all up. Um, yeah, I mean, leaves first, then, then the tree. And it's done, the, sh the machine can do sheets like that big. So it was doing six frames on one sheet. And I had to do all the leaves of one color first, and then all the leaves of another color, and then all the fruits, whatever, and then all the, tr all the branches. And it should have done leaves of, you know, on one frame, and then the branch on that frame, and then moved on to the next one. Because as it's adding more and more thread, everything is kind of pulling together a little bit and shifting a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's thread, and it's annoying, and it, it doesn't, <laughs> you know, it's not like ink that stays put. It, but, from one leaf to another, uh, I think, the, so the algorithm, I mean, first of all, it's, it's fairly easy to do. It's traveling salesman optimization to find the leaf order. Um, and I think, I, I think that I had, um, some so like sanity checks in there where if it was going a really insane distance, you know, up and around these branches, just to, it would then stop and cut it. Because, I mean, the machine can do it. It has a thread cutter. It's just that that's where the failures occur. And also, it takes as long to stop and cut as it does to stitch, you know, several inches. Um, so it was, you know, there's some, there's some sort of, you know, trade-offs there that I believe is taking into account. I forget, that was a while ago. Um, with, with quilting, you can talk about the shrinking issue and how, you know, oh, yeah, it well, could also be a model. I've, I've, I've been working on a finite element model of fabric because the, the biggest problem with these things is that as you're stitching along, um, the, you know, the fabric is shrinking. It's being pulled together. And so, um, you know, one of the problems with the, the postman tour optimization is, you know, it finds a path that's great, but it doesn't consider the fact that if you, let's say, stitch a whole bunch here, and then go off and you know, stitch a whole bunch over here, and then come back and finish up a little bit over here, that's really bad because things will have shifted. And I would gladly pay a penalty of you know, duplicate stitching or, or whatever 
to keep the locality of reference, as it were, tighter and keep it. And in fact, the fact that it's Faustian tour means it actually tries in the optimization to get back where it started from, which is precisely what you don't want. And I've been haggling uh, to try to get a version of these algorithms that don't try to come back. I just you know, like start here, finish wherever you want. I don't care about the last jump. That's you know, I would you know, would like that in the algorithm. It would help a lot. But I would also like a penalty that is to do with the age disparity between neighboring paths, um, and like minimize the time there's a very old path and a very new path next to each other. Um, that you know, I don't know. I, I have no idea how you would go about adding that into some of these algorithms. Um, yeah, it's so really. My next, my backup plan is is a finite element model of the fabric where I can model the stitching and model the shrinkage so that one can then you know, back that into the positions and compensate for it uh, so that you know, it'll come together. But the mesh is, um, unfortunately, I don't know system model or I don't know how to use it. And um, I'm just trying to do it just with fine minimum or whatever. And it's not working and, um, maybe someday. Yeah, you can see on this, if you examine it, you can see some little places where things, yeah, things were stitched they very like far apart. a quarter apart. of an inch out of alignment, yeah. which is really irritating. Um, and you know, if, if this stuff was just made out of metal mesh and didn't stretch or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, well, I don't think you can, because when you, like it takes, so I mean, the basic operation is take one frame, take all the pixels out of that frame at a fairly low resolution. So you have, and then just turn that into a soup of pixels and sort them. And there's, you know, you've, you've lost all the information about where they were. So there's no way that you can put it back. So the, the solution that we have for that in the app is actually if we had an iPad, um, we could very quickly plug in the app. Um, because it's, it's, a, it's a thing you might want to do. Uh, Plug that in. If you sort of know the movie but aren't really sure, um, let's see, is that working? Oh, look at that, it worked. Okay, so uh, if we go to the giant color map thing. Um, so what you can do is you can just touch uh, any of these things, and it gets a little bigger, and it gives you a thumbnail. Um, so you can swipe through it, and you can see the thumbnail. So like if you find Lion King, it's in here. There we go. There was Lion King. Okay, so there's Lion King, um, and here you can see like you know there's there's the happy, the blue, and the greens are happy, and, and if you know the movie, sort of towards the end, uh, it's just dark, it's bad, things are bad, and, uh, and then it gets worse. There's fire and there's just battling, and everything is really bad, and and then, and then it just gets worse. It's nighttime and it's dark and it's it's just miserable and raining. And and then the morning dawns and it's beautiful, and blue. And then we go to the credits. Um, so that little stab of blue at the end, that's the happy ending. And the big bar at the end, that's always that's the end credits there. And when you look at the whole thing, you can actually see all kinds of things about the history of Disney. For example, right here, um, that's the invention of end credits because you notice before then, the movie just kind of ended. Uh, and they listed a few people, like the most important people at the beginning of the movie, and they just didn't list the hundreds of other people that worked on it. And then all of a sudden, there was this phase transition, and they realized, like, you can't list half the people or a third of the people. You can either list the director and the producer and six other people, or else you have to do everybody, including the babies born during the production, which is now standard on movies. Um, and so the end credits became incredibly long. You can also see when they made crap movies. So. Um, they, they spent a decade or two making really bad movies, which happened to correspond exactly to the point where they became dark. Uh, so there's this kind of band in here um, where the movie's really not very good. Um, and I don't know. I, I, I prefer to think of it as <laughs> metaphorical or something. Uh, you can see the last couple have had incredibly strong color palettes, like Wreck-It Ralph um, is is just, uh, can we stop that? Um, Wreck-It Ralph is extremely, you know, reddish, pinkish sort of a, a thing. Uh, and then Frozen is just astonishingly blue. It's basically all ice throughout the whole movie. Um, and it's really a question of what, what shade of 
light blue you want. Um, and uh, Snow White, it's very earth tones. This was their very first movie. Um, and they actually, it's interesting you ask about the color transfer. I don't think that's the case because they're actually quite careful about this. And I asked the guy, um, how, how do you know what the colors actually looked like? Because nobody alive, um, you know, they, they, they may remember. There are people who saw this when it first came out, but they were little kids then, and now, you know, they're in their 70s. They don't remember what those colors looked like. And the film has all, you know, faded. And how can you tell what did it really look like? And the answer is there's oil paintings that were the backgrounds in these movies. And so they've gone back, and, and those don't change. You know, they were stored in cold storage and dark and, and archival vaults. And it's quite, you know, confidently you can say that the colors have not changed. And so they color balance it to the oil paintings that were the backgrounds of those movies. Um, so this is actually the real colors of Snow White, pretty close. Um, maybe these other movies, the crap ones, they didn't really care about. I don't know. Um, but um, but then, you know, then they started making great movies again. And Frozen is really good, and Wreck-It Ralph is really good. And um, you know, there's some, you know, they've, they've had periods of making absolutely astonishingly good movies, and some periods of not such great movies, um, and everything in between. And what's really astonishing is just the sheer quantity of stuff that they have done over such a long period of time. So I think there are, I believe what we ended up with was 1,024 frames per movie. So, you know, if a movie is 100 minutes long, that would be 10 frames, so like every six seconds, roughly. I think that's what we ended up with. So the color maps plus the thumbnails, I believe, was about 80 megabytes altogether. The thumbnails are all in one giant compressed QuickTime movie. So, you know, it's, the whole thing is all crammed together into one thing, which it then picks the frames out of. Um, but, you know, that's, it's, it's a challenge to, oh, this is, a, this is a, to do with my new book, Molecules. And of course, we made an embroidered version of it. Um, it's an embroidered molecule. Um, I don't know what time it is. Are we supposed to be stopping soon? Or? Yeah, I think, I think our time is up. <laughs>